Well, good morning, everyone. I make it a 9.30. Um, so we're going to start together this morning. Before we start together, it would be good to pray, wouldn't it? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the chance we've had to be together this week, to spend time in your word, to meditate upon you and your truths. Thank you so much for your word and the wisdom it contains. And Father, I pray that you will give us more glimpses of that this morning as we spend our time together now. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, so this happens this week. I was cooking and I did one of those terrible things as I burnt a saucepan in a holiday cottage. <laughs> it's one of those saucepans that's burnt and you're scrubbing at it with all the washing up liquid and things. This is not, not going to come off. But there's a brilliant life hack if you're in that situation. I just needed to get the ingredients. You need vinegar. You need some sort of baking powder or bicarb or your baking soda and a bit of washing up liquid, stick it on, on the hob and then it all bubbles up and it does m chemistry magic and then it all just wipes clean. In fact, it was shinier at the end of it than it was before we began. Life hacks, wisdom that you get passed on. Um, and when you're in those situations, you can Google them now. But people used to pass them on to one another, didn't they? Grandparents would pass on that thing. If you really want to clean um, your, uh, a stove properly, you, what do you use? You use all that horrible old ash with, white, with, with water and you can actually clean your wood-burning stove and make the shiny glass shiny just by using ash and water. It's like magic. Life hacks, they're great. Wisdom. That's what we're looking at today. Um, and we are very familiar, aren't we, I think, with the book of Proverbs being a wonderful place full of wisdom. I mean, there, there are wonderful verses. I'll just give you um, a, just a taste of a few of them. Um, Proverbs 24, verse 13. Eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb that is sweet to your taste. That's nice. I love honey. But know also that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there's a future hope for you and your hope will not be cut off. We kind of expect stuff like that from Proverbs, don't we? But it has this other sort of more earthy, earthy wisdom. I mean, just look across the page in my Bible on chapter 23. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. And there's a poetic description of what it means to be drunk. But turn over the page and then you get this. If you find honey, eat just enough, too much of it, and you will vomit. <laughs> it's quite earthy, isn't it? Wisdom and life hacks and things that are passed on from generation to generation. Is that what biblical wisdom is about? Our bookshops are full of wisdom and advice and self-help books. And I don't know if you came across a, a few years ago that poem it did, it was, it was very popular on YouTube for a while and it may be a bit dated now, it's been around for a while. Have you come across Wear Sunscreen? It's a talking poem. I'll read you, some of you have, I'll read you a little bit of it. It was done um, to, to a group of um, students as they were graduating and this was performed. That's why, so it became popular on, on YouTube. And uh, this is how it starts. It says, if I could offer you only one tip for the future, sunscreen would be it. Now my husband does dermatology, he'd say factor 50, by the way. <laughs> the long-term benefits of sunscreen have been proved by scientists whereas the rest of my advice has no basis more reliable than my own meandering experience. But I will dispense this advice now. Enjoy the power and beauty of your youth. Oh, never mind. You will not understand the power and beauty of your youth until they faded. But trust me, in 20 years, you'll look back at photos of yourself and recall in a way that you can't grasp now how much possibility lay before you 
and how fabulous you really looked. You are not as fat as you imagine. Don't worry about the future. Or worry, but know that worrying is as effective as trying to solve an algebra equation by chewing bubblegum. The real troubles in your life are apt to be things that never crossed your worried mind, the kind that blindsides you at 4 p.m. on some idle Tuesday. Don't waste your time on jealousy. Sometimes you're ahead, sometimes you're behind. The race is long, and in the end, it's only with yourself. Do not read beauty magazines. They will only make you feel ugly. Get to know your parents. You never know when they'll be gone for good. Be nice to your siblings. They're your best link to your past and the people most likely to stick with you in the future. Don't mess too much with your hair or by the time you're full 40, it will look 85. Be careful whose advice you buy, but be patient with those who supply it. But trust me, on the sunscreen. That's an abridged version of the sort of advice that goes around in our culture. Wisdom. But this morning we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes, I have discovered, is a bit like Marmite. When I tell people I really love Ecclesiastes, some of them look at me like I'm mad. <laughs> because Ecclesiastes, a lot of people think, is actually not like all that other stuff, you know, full of nice wisdom. It's sort of kind of heartwarming. You kind of relate to it and you think, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's good. No, the, the Ecclesiastes is one of those books that just can come across as being a bit sort of, well, pessimistic. I mean, pretty much opens like this, doesn't it? Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He doesn't sound like much fun, does he? <laughs> you know, you know those sorts of people that walk into a room and some people just walk into the room and they just lighten it all up. You know, that, that wonderful radiator personality. And you think, actually, the preacher from Ecclesiastes comes into the room and he's the drain. <laughs> because everything that we love, he seems to dismiss. And he just goes, meaningless. Meaningless. In Ecclesiastes 1.14, he says, I've seen all the things that are done under the sun, and all of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Yet everything we like, he has a go at. So in Ecclesiastes 1.18, he says, For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. The more you know, the wiser you are, the more unhappy you will be. And there's truth in that too, isn't there? When we actually open our eyes and we look around and see things that kind of we'd wish we didn't know. I mean, I don't know if you ever have that experience. You think, I just don't want to listen to the news anymore. And I listen to the news. It's just so, so miserable and he says the more you see the more you know actually the more grief and he really is that dampener because this is what he says about laughter in Ecclesiastes 2 2 he says laughter is madness and what does pleasure accomplish and then if you read through Ecclesiastes 2, he just has a go at absolutely everything. He talks about all the projects he undertakes and he writes off the beauty of architecture, amazing gardens, amazing agriculture and farms. He has, you know, the, the privilege of having many, many staff, wealth, treasure, the joy of music. No, all of it. When he looks at it, he says, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And this is something some of us may relate to. He wasn't that keen on work either. He said, work that is done 
under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's not looking good, is it? It's a bit miserable. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Last day of the of Keswick Convention and this. But actually what I hope to be able to show you today is that he is passing on wisdom that is extraordinary. Really important and essential for our walk with the Lord. You see that word meaningless that um, he uses over and over and over again um, is not translated well in our Bibles. If you have an ESV, it says vanity, um, but I don't think we really understand that word vanity in the way that it used to be understood, so I think that we miss something there. Um, the, the Hebrew word um, is anglicized, either, you either say hebel or hevel, um, and all the different commentators decide to go on one or the other. But basically what uh, the heart of it is, is trying to describe something that is like a mist that appears and disappears, like a, like a vapor, something that is temporary. And I think that fleetingness, that being temporary, is what he's really talking about here. So every time you see the word meaningless, it's much better, I think, to, to get to the heart of it, to put in the word temporary or fleeting, whichever one you prefer. Everything is just passing on. Nothing is, nothing is permanent. It just comes and it goes. Let me read to you the beginning of his book. 1 verse 3. What do people gain from their labours at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. Even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Everything goes on and on and on and round and round and round the same. The generations, well, they come and they go and they're not remembered. I mentioned earlier, didn't I, about that ancestry thing um, earlier this week about trying to chase back the family. I mean, and I see one of my daughters managed to trace a line back. We didn't really discover very much about any of those people. We discovered we had some coal miners in our background, um, bakers and uh, butchers. So there you go. But oh, those people, we knew nothing about them. And that was the ones that we actually found some information on. Yes, you don't remember them doesn't take long for a generation to not be forgotten. Every generation's come and go and we're no different. Um, at the moment, um, uh, in our church, we, we have a book group in which we invite our friends who aren't part of church to come along. So we read all sorts of different things together and chat and hope that we can actually have a chance to talk about the gospel. Well, somebody chose this book, which is fantastic, actually, because it is, they didn't know why they were choosing it. I'm so pleased they did, because it's going to we're going to have a great discussion, I think, follow the fact that they've chosen this book. So this is in our summer read. It's called 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. There you go. Um, and uh, it starts like this. So let's uh, find, find the page where it starts. The average human lifespan is absurdly, terrifyingly, insultingly short. You think about how short a life is. Assuming you live to be 80, you'll have had about 4,000 weeks. Think about that. He says, when I first made the 4,000 weeks calculation, I felt queasy. 
But once I'd recovered, I started pestering my friends, asking them to guess off the top of their heads without doing any mental arithmetic how many weeks they thought the average person could expect to live. One named a number in the six figures. Yet, as I felt obliged to inform her, a fairly modest six-figure figure number of weeks, 310,000, is the approximate duration of all human civilization. <laughs> It's not very long, is it? And fleeting, that is what the writer to Ecclesiastes wants us to know. Life is fleeting. And this book is, is trying to work out what you do in that short period of time, seeing as life is so short. And how we want to try and capture time, don't we? We want to hold on to it. We want things to last forever. I mean, I don't know, you have an amazing week in Keswick. Are you enjoying being here and thinking, oh, actually, on Monday, I've got to go back to work. I want this day to last a long, long time. I want to hold on to it. Oh, but I can't. Because it just keeps moving on. Time marches on, however we feel about it. And time flies, as they say. Well, that is full of wisdom about how to make the most of your time, sort of. But it's that sort of secular wisdom. The teacher sees the issue and he wants to show us the world from a whole different perspective. And he looks at the world from two angles. Let me show you the first angle that he looks at. So he look, the first angle he looks at um, he, he, he sort of interplays it, so it's not sort of divided up neatly through the book. He goes back to one and then back to another, so it's sort of interspersed. But this is the first angle that he, he talks about, really, um, in chapter 1, verse 12. I, the teacher, were king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. Now this is the first perspective that he looks at. He looks at the world as, and he describes what it means to be under the heavens. And this I think is the world from God's perspective. This is how God has established things and the teacher looks at it. And then he looks at the second perspective, verse 14. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. That's the world we experience. But verse 15 is a really important verse here. Because this is describing, as God looks down on the world, what the world is like. And he says this. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. And it's one of those sort of poetic phrases that you think, well, what was he going on about? But he's basically saying the world is fallen. And God looks down on a fallen world. And we can't make it better. We've looked at that this week, haven't we? We can't make it better. Only in the gospel. I mean, those words crooked and straightened, you actually think, make way the straight path as Jesus comes. He's the one that can make the crooked straight. But we can't. And we exist in a world that is fallen and is broken. And then he, sh he has a question. A question that comes up in 2 verse 3. No, verse... No, verse um, Yes, yeah, it's verse, verse 3. He says, I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their life. So we live in a fallen world, and God is looking down on our fallen, broken world, but what is good for us to do, seeing as we're not around for very long? What, what is good to do? And his conclusion is everything is temporary. All that list that I gave you at the beginning. So what is good? He comes to this conclusion in chapter 3. So you might like to look at chapter 3 with me if you've got a Bible there. This is what he says. 
chapter 3, verse 1, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. So in a fallen, broken world, God has enabled all these things to happen and they're all right at certain different times. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep, yes, there's time to weep when it's right to weep, and a time to laugh. Even the miserable preacher of Ecclesiastes actually can see that there is a time to laugh, and a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Yet under the heavens, in a fallen, broken world, God has said there's a time for all of those things. Now, some of those things we struggle with, we don't like, but sometimes it is right. We've talked this week, haven't we, about how it's right to hate evil, a time to hate. There is a time for everything. And actually, the preacher isn't as miserable as we think, because he does say there's a time to dance, a time to laugh, there's a time to be on holiday in Keswick and just rejoice with one another and enjoy the beauty of this place, of being with friends and family and just wonderful. But there's also Monday morning coming around the corner, and that's good too. There's a time for that too. Yeah, all of it. In God's world, there is time for everything. But under the heavens, there is something really important here. And this is the second perspective under the heavens. And carrying on reading. What do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden the Lord God has laid on the human race. He's made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That's a great thing. If you are happy and you do good, isn't that wonderful? He knows that's good. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is a gift of God. Oh, there's a little hint. To actually have work that you enjoy. What a privilege. What a blessing. To find satisfaction in your work. Yes, it won't last forever. He knows it's passing. But to enjoy your work as you do it, what a, what a blessing to have food and drink, to have what you need. What blessing. This is good. None of those things last for us, but he says, verse 14, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. And God does it so that people will fear him. This is like, we, we talked about Paul's sermon, in, you probably don't remember, but we, we referenced Paul's sermon to Acts, how he was showing the people in Athens that God was the creator God, and he'd established all things so people might come to know him. This is where it comes from. God works through everything, so he does it so that people will fear him, that people will know him. Whatever is has already been, and whatever will be has been before, and God will call the past into account. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. So in our fallen world, there isn't justice and good judgment. There's wickedness and mess. But under the heavens, there's this really central truth to the book of Ecclesiastes. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked for there will be a time for every activity 
a time to judge every deed. Everything we do, all of those things we do, the choices we make, God will judge. Human judgment fails. God's judgment is righteous. And it will come. God will judge everything that happens under the sun. Because we're under the heavens. And how we live under the sun matters. We will be judged. That's not something that our culture likes, is it? It's the perspective of the preacher in Ecclesiastes. It's really, really important. But we don't think we should be judged. We think we are, we're good, don't we? There was that poem, another poem, the poems this morning. And the Invictus poem, you know, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. I'm the one that makes the decisions. I understand myself. I've, I'm moral. Other people aren't moral. I mean, I think actually, it's something I've been talking about with, with some people recently um, who are in their 20s. And their observation, even amongst um, people, yeah, it, through all sorts of different types of people, is actually people are very self-righteous today. Very self-righteous. It doesn't matter what perspective you have, you think, my perspective is right, your perspective is wrong. It's because we, we're so internalized. We, we are looking to find our own selves, our own path, our, our own true selves. And when we find our own true self, it doesn't matter what you think, you're wrong. My truth matters. No, one, no outside voice has the right to challenge me and my morality my decisions, what I do with my time. And that's how we function under the sun. And we don't get on very well, do we? There's a lot of division in all, so politically, socially, in all sorts of areas. People won't tolerate people. I know somebody who didn't go to a friend's wedding because of their position on something. It's really sad. It's really sad. And they were just... They, they're not Christians. It was just a mess. Sad. How dare anyone judge me? But see, under the heavens, God judges everyone. But he's a righteous judge and he has the right to judge because he's the creator God. It's not new, actually, the way our society conducts itself. C.S. Lewis said this a long time ago in God in the Dock. He said, the ancient man approached God as the accused person approaches his judge. You see, ancient people actually had some concept that God had a right to judge them. But for modern man, and this is C.S. Lewis speaking, so it's not that modern when he was talking about modern man, is it? We're talking 50, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago. For modern man, the roles are reversed. Modern man is the judge. God is in the dock. Yes, I am my own spiritual authority. And I think we can do that in the church too, can't we? You know, we might read the Bible actually just to back up our own position. Cut out the bits I don't like. Just create the truths I want to follow. Ignore the rest. God will judge us all for how we use our time. He has the right to judge us. And that is underpinning the preacher in Ecclesiastes. Use your time well, God is the judge. His other perspective, though, that he looks at is the under the sun. And his under the sun perspective actually shows us that life in this world can be really tough. I have a friend who has had one of those really tough lives. She's battled um, with a bipolar disorder for, for the whole of her, her adult life. And she's had problems within her family. And there's just nothing, you know, you know people who have those lives, don't you? Nothing just goes smoothly. Everything just keeps going wrong. And, and yet she holds on because she says, you know, my favorite book in the Bible is Ecclesiastes. But it's so realistic. Understands that life can be hard. And I can know that God is still in control. And that's good, isn't it? But so the writer to Ecclesiastes makes us have a look at it. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, he says, Again, I looked and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. 
I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they had no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. Yeah, it's hard when you see that, isn't it? In fact, when he looked at it, he, verse 3, he says, um, better than both is one who's never been born, who's not seen the evil that's done under the sun. That's quite a dramatic response. And he looks and he sees all sorts of evil, of oppression. He sees political leaders failing. Chapter 10, he says, there's an evil I've seen under the sun, the sort of error that comes from a ruler. And then he looks at how foolish people are in charge and the people that actually have got some wisdom are not in charge and no one's listening to the wise voices and fools are reigning over people and and oppressing the people and being unjust. And you think, oh, I think he might be talking about things that I can recognize and see around me. And then the other thing that he he says a lot is that life under the sun is unpredictable says chapter 9 I've seen something else under the sun the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned but time and chance happen to them all you think you can control it you think that you can put everything in place and you can't things can go wrong what was that poem at the beginning the real troubles in your life are apt to be the things that never crossed your worried mind the kind of things that blindside you at 4 p.m on some idle tuesday laura kenny last week had a piece in one of the papers you know laura kenny this great cyclist the, probably one of the greatest women's sports people of, of all time olympic champion did she won olympic gold at the last olympics what happened to her following that olympics well, she's married to Jason, and they had a miscarriage. And then she had um, surgery earlier this year to have an ectopic pregnancy, um, fallopian tube removed. It's been heartbreaking. She said, I felt like nothing was going our way at all. January was the tipping point. I was at breaking point. Uh, she had Jason, Kenny, also one of our greatest cyclists. So by her side, she says, yeah, together they've sort of got through. But you know, they, how successful Laura and Jason Kenny. You know, the great British Olympians. And yet that can happen to them because it can happen to any of us. The horrors and pains just around the corner. The writer to Ecclesiastes is really realistic. This is the world, this is life under the sun. Now, this book, which we're, I'm reading my, my book group, we're going to have a chance to discuss uh, with, with, with a group of people. Um, I'm, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if we can get some of the gospel in because cause it talks to this issue. But this is uh, the solution that this book comes to in the light of that unpredictability of life. It just says, um, let's see if I can find that. It says, ultimately the best thing best position you can take is this. You need to say, I don't mind what happens. Chill. Chill. It doesn't matter. I mean, if I'm being generous, it's actually trying to say, try and just be content. Whatever happens. You can't control it, so just embrace it and ah, there's some truth in that, isn't there? But it's also the counsel of despair. Because God does mind what happens. He grieves. And he knows that there's injustice. And he does mind what happens. See, the preacher isn't hopeless. Because he knows what faces us under the sun, but he also knows that we're under the heavens. So although we don't know what what we might face, he knows that we are in God's hands. And so although we don't know what the future is, he can look through the book of Ecclesiastes, what's good to do now? What are the good things to do under the sun? So although we started by saying that he was very miserable about all these things, actually he has, he has real clarity about what's good to do now and what we can rejoice in. And he says work is good. Actually work is good. 
he says, friendship is good. You know Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. If you're on your own, that, that's really hard. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. People always think about this as marriage. It's not about marriage. It's actually talking about friendship. It's talking about the importance of relationships in our lives. They're good. I mean, it may be that your marriage is your friendship, and that's that. Yes, it can be marriage, but it's not just about marriage. Saying it's hard to be completely isolated and on your own. But what joy to have others that you can trust and who you can you can walk alongside. It's a good thing. And actually, he's not the party pooper because he says food is good. Ecclesiastes eight. He says, so I commend the enjoyment of life because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of life God has given them under the sun. No, it's great. You can enjoy those good things. He celebrates marriage and he also says that wisdom is good. So wisdom can make you sad but he says, wisdom is better than folly. Just as light is better than darkness. So it's not just a little bit better, is it? It's actually hugely better. Wisdom is better than folly. So he celebrates the good things and the things that are good for us to embrace under the sun. How's this for one of the things that he celebrates? You might want to turn, turn towards the end of the book. If you've got a Bible there, have a look at um, chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 9. You who are young, be happy while you are young and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, there's a, if I stop reading there, enjoy your youth, enjoy your strength, enjoy the things that you can do because you're young. You can climb up cat bells. In fact, you can climb up much higher than cat bells, can't you? It's great. You won't always be able to do it. <laughs> you know, however fit you are, However much you want to, to keep your fitness level, and even if you're one of these people in your 80s who's going to be running marathons, you won't always be able to climb up cat bells. But you can embrace and enjoy these things. They're good. But there's a huge thing here. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. There's that perspective again. See, how you choose to use your youth, how you choose to use your energy, how you choose to use everything that you have at your disposal, God will bring you into judgment. How you use your time. So you can embrace the good things, yes, but just keep that perspective. He wants you to do good. Because he says... Verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Now, I could, could read you the whole of this chapter. I, it, this is an incredible chapter. It has an amazing poem about what it means to age. And the fact that getting older and not being able to hear properly, not being able to see properly. Being a bit more nervous about everything. Yeah, just sort of that step that came unexpectedly made you feel a bit more wobbly and you're frightened you actually might fall down and you might actually do some serious damage because now when you knock your leg it just takes so long to heal. It comes, frailty comes, we're finite, we're frail and the preacher says that's going to come. So when you've got the young, vigorous energy, 
Just keep remembering where you're headed, but remember ultimately God is your judge. Because ultimately what he wants to say is where we get to in 12 verse 6. Remember him. Remember him. Remember God. Before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well. And the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. That's a sort of Hebrew poetry, but basically, basically what he's saying is remember him before you die. Temporary, temporary, brief, 4,000 weeks. Remember him before you die. He actually um, says that that can come even before you're old. I mean, chapter 9, he says, actually, no one knows when their hour will come. There's a phrase that's probably people do use a bit, don't they? comes from Ecclesiastes. He says, as fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. Sometimes people die unexpectedly. Young. Yeah, he wants us to understand that how we live under the sun, we can enjoy good things, but it does matter that we remember that God is our judge. Understand that we're transient, we're passing through, we will die. And so he says these quite shocking words, which is why he gets judged as being miserable, but it's really important in chapter seven. He says in chapter seven, verse two, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Better to go to a house of mourning than a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. This summer, um, there's been a breakout hit, George Ezra's song, do people know it? The uh, green, green grass, blue, blue sky. You better throw a party on the day that I die. He, um, it went to number one. And I think it's still in top 20. I think it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's the big hit of the year, probably. He sang it at the, at, at the Jubilee. Do you know that um, he got asked, you probably some of you will know this, but he got asked to change the lyric when he sang it at Buckingham Palace. He had to sing, um, green, green grass, blue, blue sky, you better throw a party on the day that I did, 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 did. You know, he basically didn't, couldn't say that I die. So you better throw a party, full stop. <laughs> but it didn't kind of make sense. But he wasn't allowed to talk about death. Now the people at the palace were a bit worried that the queen's a bit old. It's ridiculous. He talked about that um, song and why he wrote it. And apparently he was on holiday, in, as you are as a pop star, in St. Lucia. And he heard this party music somewhere. And he said, that sounds amazing, that music. That's really great. I wonder who's having that party. I think I'll go along. I'm George Ezra. <laughs> I'll go along and, and find out what's going on. And he, he went along and he spoke to someone and said, what's happening over there? This is amazing, sort of vibrant party going on in St. Lucia. And he said, it's a funeral party. Now, that's different from the wailing we were thinking about in Jeremiah, isn't it? We're celebrating a life. And so he wrote a song. He thought, what a wonderful thing to do to to celebrate a life. I don't think the preacher to Ecclesiastes is telling us quite that sort of idea. He does say it's better to go to the house of mourning, but I think he wants us to mourn, um, not to just pretend that everything's going to be okay and that death doesn't matter. I think he wants us to see the reality of death and the sadness of it. I was talking to someone yesterday who was telling me how her mother died a month ago and how painful and hard that was. And she was a believer and she had carers coming into her home and um, those carers got so close to her that they would come in even when they weren't on shift because she has had such a wonderful testimony about Jesus. and. She was just changing their lives as they were engaging with her, which was wonderful. And they were all, on the, all there at the funeral, 
hearing the joy of the resurrection. But at the same time, it was a time of deep sadness. And one of the carers, when, when this woman was dying, one of the carers said, this is a really strange thing, and I don't know quite how to say this, but today's been one of the best days of my life. Even though she was spending time with a dying woman, there was something about this woman's perspective and her hope and the reality of life and the gospel hope that was testifying to those people who had no hope as they looked death in the face. It wasn't a party, it wasn't a George Ezra, let's pretend nothing's real. It was looking at it really in the face. Pray for those people that they won't lose that testimony that they saw and they will come to know the truth of the resurrection personally. Yeah, death is a reality and the writer of Ecclesiastes wants you to look it in the face. It's not something that we like to look at. Earlier this year, um, terrible things have been happening in Ukraine and there was a woman, young woman called Marina Nadishna who works for IFES in Ukraine doing student ministry. She needed to evacuate her home and she said this, this uh, quoting her, she said, life changed completely. Some things I understand differently. When you need to evacuate, what do you take with you? You think about that. I don't know what we, I mean, I often think, what do you take with you if you've got to leave everything? I mean, people often, the classic answer is, I take my photo album, I take the photos. You can't replace the photos. She didn't say that. She said, the most precious thing is your soul. Confidence that you're going to be with Jesus no matter what. And my stepsister said, am I going to die? And I said, oh, I don't know, what are you going to say to your stepsister when she says, I'm, am I going to die? I said, it's all right, it's going to be okay, we're going to get out, we're going to be fine. And she didn't say that either. She said, I said, yes, we're all going to die. It's not a matter of where and when and how, but are you going to be with Jesus? There's a perspective. That is the perspective the preacher from Ecclesiastes wants us to have every day as we walk through life. Well, that young woman's stepsister has turned to Christ. And in the midst of all that, Marina says that was the happiest day of her life. There's a perspective. The perspective the preacher wants us to have. So we can be grateful, can't we, for this wisdom? Because it's not telling us all the minutiae of how you should live in terms of the sort of the detail, right? you need bicarbonate soda and you need vinegar and clean the saucepan stuff. But it teaches us the greatest truth about God. And it tells us to keep our eyes on him, to keep that perspective. See, it's not just observations about life under the sun, but it's showing us God's plan for eternity there is eternity, it matters. And these sort of self-help books that give you, there are some things in here that, that we think, yeah, that's quite useful. But what they don't have, which is what biblical wisdom has, they don't have the perspective of the fear of the Lord. They don't have the under the heavens perspective. They're just grappling around trying to make crooked things straight in life under the sun. Wisdom literature gives us the full picture. And so it can teach us so much. Just a few things as we end our time together. I think it teaches us to walk patiently and to use now well. Not to be surprised by hard times. I think it can help us see and give us a new freedom because actually what really matters is the future and not what I achieve now. 
And you don't feel very successful. The career wasn't as amazing as you thought it was going to be. You didn't get through uni. You didn't get the promotion. You didn't have the children you wanted. You didn't have the health you wanted. You didn't, you know, actually, it's not about any of that. The question that you always have is, do I acknowledge the Lord now? Can I use my time well now for him? And what would that look like in the circumstances in which I find myself now? And all those other dreams that we have, well, they can be good, we can enjoy them, they're great things, but what really matters is eternity. That's what really matters. In reality, now, the other thing we learn is that it will be the best of times and the worst of times all of the time. In our churches, don't overexpect. don't get angry when your church is not all you want it to be, it won't be. But enjoy those moments of great joy when church is amazing. In our churches alongside somebody celebrating the news of their pregnancy, there'll be somebody weeping at the loss of a child, side by side. That's life under the sun. So we should just plod faithfully. Often people will say to us, we're in a church plant. We're a very small church plant. Um, and people say, how's it going? And you know people want to hear stories of great change and success and all sorts of things. And you think, it's, we're just plodding faithfully. We just want to serve the Lord faithfully each day. What do I have to do today to serve him? And then the rest is the Lord's, isn't it? It's his work. So use your time faithfully. Use our time while we can. See, I think the book to Ecclesiastes really teaches us to relate to time well. Our culture's obsessed with how to use our time. I think the book of Ecclesiastes teaches us how to use our time well. Let me just um, quote to you from another book that... Um, I love this book. It's one of my favorite reads this year. This is a Christian book. It's called You're Only Human by Kelly M. Capick. It's full of all sorts of really helpful things. Um, let me try and find the, the page. There's an example of how that perspective just changes and frees you up. This um, it's a silly little story, but it might illustrate it. He's American, so... By the middle of my freshman year in high school, through the ministry of a Baptist youth group and other providential events, faith became real to me and I became a follower of Jesus. Not long afterwards, I stopped making photo albums and keeping memorabilia. This happened naturally without my even thinking about it at the time. Only decades later could I look back and make more sense of that significant change. Now please don't be offended if you're a big scrapbooker. But for me, with my particular history, this evolution represented a healthy development. The burden of making this life everything was starting to lift. My horizon had profoundly expounded. Now there was so much more to life than three score years and ten. And there were still endless things I wanted to do, see and accomplish, but it felt different. Accumulating and achieving events and memories to give my life meaning no longer mattered as much as it had. I began to discover my life already had meaning and I didn't have to make it so. God had given my life and story purpose beyond anything I could conjure up on my own. Just think about that God has given our lives just so much more purpose beyond anything we can conjure up beyond our imaginings of how we're using our time. He's given us such greater purpose. And then he says, thankfully, I didn't need to squeeze an eternity's worth of life into my adolescence. I was now liberated to see my life against the backdrop of God's good and trustworthy eternity. Living in the light of eternity does change everything. Wisdom. God's wisdom is very different from the world's wisdom and it's wonderful. And we've been rejoicing today in the wisdom of the Old Testament. 
But as we finish this series together, I want to just take you to the New Testament. Um, just turn with me to 2 Timothy 3. Two Timothy three, very famous words. Paul writing to Timothy he says, But for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you've learnt it, and how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why go there at the end of this series? Well, because when Paul's talking to Timothy, he's saying to Timothy, keep going with the Holy Scriptures. Keep going in the Holy Scriptures. And he's not talking about the New Testament here, is he? He is talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about all the things we've been looking at. From Genesis through to Malachi. Keep with it. Because it does make you wise for salvation. I hope we've got a little taste of that this week. And it does thoroughly equip for every good work. That word thoroughly is pretty all-encompassing, isn't it? It does give us everything we need. So just as Paul exalted Timothy, I'd like to exalt you to keep going with those holy scriptures and spend time in them, knowing they can make you wise for salvation and thoroughly equip you. Now if it's, again, if it's something you think, I'd want to study the Bible a bit more, but I feel a bit at sea, there's loads and loads of good things on the book, book, at the bookshop that will, can help you dig in a bit more. Um, I just wanted to flag up, and it's a bit left field, but someone told me I should flag it up, so I will do it. Um, another book that I've written, it is on a completely different subject, it's called Unleash the Word, which is about studying the Bible in small groups. But the reason for flagging it up today is that what I cover is actually how we actually study a passage. And actually how so often when we read the Bible, we, we don't get it all in one go. But we do get a bit. And then we get a bit more. And then we get a bit more and keep going. And actually it can be a useful book, not for just leading small groups. So that was why it was written, for help people lead, lead in their small Bible study groups. It actually might be useful if you're reading the Bible with someone else. And actually it does, it does do something on how you can just look at a passage and say, what does it say? What does it mean? And... Why is, it, what is, why is it important? So it does deal with some of those things too. So you might find it helpful. And anyway, Jonathan publishes it and he you know, wants me to flag it up. It's there. As we finish, I want to um, read you those last verses in Ecclesiastes. Um, it finishes with these words. And maybe we shouldn't read them out loud to Jonathan Carswell. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads, and their collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. See, the one shepherd is behind the words of this book, Jesus. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Stick with this. Don't make up your own wisdom. Stick with God's wisdom. Of the making of many books, there is no end and much study where is the body now all has been heard here is the conclusion of the matter and this is kind of like the conclusion of God's masterpiece fear God and keep his commandments for this is the duty of all mankind for God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your wisdom. We want to thank you for your word, which makes us wise for salvation and thoroughly equips us. And Father, thank you for this book of Ecclesiastes 
and its perspective. And we, Father, we pray that you would give us that right perspective of life, understanding what life is like under the sun, but also knowing that you have set eternity in our hearts and that you have got a great and wonderful future in eternity for your people. Teach us to fear you rightly, to walk with you rightly, to use our youth, to use our energy, to, to use every bit of energy we have, even if we're older and feeling beginning to feel frail, that we will live and use our days for your glory. They teach us to use our time well. Teach us to keep our eyes fixed on you and help us to walk faithfully. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.